right. We got hot mics. We need outtakes, Daryl. <laughs> outtakes? Yeah, you know the podcast with the like outtake snippet that they put at the beginning? Oh, like for the cold open. Yeah. I did we did a cold open. We episode. did a cold open? Yeah. We do like a but like a, you know, like where they like take some like blurb from the middle of the interview and then they like put it at the beginning. And then you have to listen to the interview to figure out where that happened. Oh yeah, we didn't do that. Hi, I'm Daryl Wanza Serrano. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latinidades. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, on Imagining Latinidades. Uh, we are in kind of conference recovery mode from the opening conference. So we're recording this uh, basically a week after that conference and uh, are, are pretty exhausted. So um, I'm one of the co-hosts, Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I'm joined by Renee Rocha. And Ariana is not here. Today we're going to uh, we're going to kind of you know spend a little bit of time recapping the uh, the conference and the ideas that uh, that folks brought to uh, to Iowa as part of Imagining Latinidades. Um, I think we're also going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, a kind of uh, an, uh, an article uh, collection of interviews uh, turned into an article that was on the Nation. Um, that that we've been wanting. There have been a couple of articles like this talking about Latinidad and the value of Latinidad. And so we want to talk about that a little bit, given that it's kind of in our name um, and address some of the kinds of like the issues uh, from a scholarly perspective and do so in a kind of explicit way. Um, Not explicit, like using a bunch of curse words. Although we can, it is a podcast, right? We could. <laughs> it's not the radio. We'd, we'd have to, we'd have to like, we'd have to like, you know, change the, I'd have to check a box that says, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, explicit yeah. content. Um, so, so no cursing, Renee. That's a, uh, 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 okay, we'll see if I can get through 40 minutes. I can always like bleep you out in post-production. That sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the plan for today. It's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a, a little bit more of a laid back episode for us. At least that's. That's my intent. We'll see what happens once we get talking about uh, about the issues. But just to start, I- I'm exhausted after after this like wonderful kind of long weekend, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday of programming for uh, our kickoff event for Imagining Latinidades. I was just I was just wrecked in the way that you're that you're like delightfully wrecked after a good conference. Yeah, but I was re- you know really impressed with um, how everything went off. Um, for those of you not in Iowa City, we were competing with with uh, Elizabeth Warren for the uh, time in our uh, Thursday keynote address. Uh, we had what seventy five people show up. Yeah, about seventy five people for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the in person attendance for the other three days I think was pretty good too. And you know, we have our sort of online presence as well. And uh, yeah, I think that went off really well. Yeah, all in all, I think, you know, if you tally up the number of people at each of the events over the course of those three days, it was over 300 people, which is pretty awesome. Like I thought I was I was pretty excited about that. I was trying to think of like when we've had that, you know, such a kind of robust audience for Latino Latino studies events in my time here at Iowa. And I'm having a hard time thinking of, you know, aside from like maybe you know, rallies of uh, major political figures who come through town, perhaps. But. Yeah. So you know, University of Iowa, Iowa City, State of Iowa, we're here, and yeah. you know, we're going to stay. We, uh, you know, it, it was it w- it was such a such a delightful thing. Oh, and sorry, one of the things that uh, that Renee just mentioned about you know, if you people who weren't able to make it to it to see it in person, uh, we we did have a really good uh, live stream going via our YouTube channel. So we'll put that uh, that link in the show notes. Um, it's also linked. And a bunch of other places on our social media, uh, in our social media. So if you can't make it to an event because you don't live in Iowa or you're just not going to be in Iowa City at that time, um, the the live streams that we had that we have up on our YouTube channel were were just excellent, like high quality, really good audio. So um, and then the other thing is, if you missed the opening conference. We're going to have uh, edited videos of all of the lectures up online soon-ish. Um, I, I think and I hope sometime before the next uh, conference event, which will be in uh, later in October. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, yeah. Well, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. What's, what's the, you know, just to kind of start talking about the, about the conference, um, what was the, what was the thing that kind of stood out to you aside from the attendance, uh, that kind of stood out to you the most, Renee? Yeah, well, one of the things I think it did is it really highlighted the um, intellectual heterogeneity of, of the field and also the way sort of I think it's developing here at our institution. I mean, there was everything from, I and mean, we had two political scientists there, although the two political scientists that we had were sort of even um, different in terms of where they sit within the discipline. You know, this is something I can geek out a little bit. Uh, Val Martinez. Uh, Ebers, who does, uh, you know, sort of maybe sort of traditional American politics work, and Anna Shampayo, who I think has been sort of very, uh, as you sort of alluded to at, at the conference, sort of like challenging some of the norms uh, uh, within the discipline, uh, sort of methodologically and, and theoretically. So, you know, I'll, you know, Val's doing the same thing too in a substantive way by emphasizing this role of, of uh, Latino politics and, and her work on especially studying Latinas and Latina members of Congress, but maybe a little bit less so methodologically. And then you go from that to, you know, presentations about, uh, you know, sort of Latinx art and then stuff about, uh, you know, migration and climate science and its uh, effects on identity. Uh, Latinx is a methodology, which was, you know, sort of moving very far away from some of the stuff that was that, that we began the conference with. And so we just got, I think, a really good sense of what this field looks like in terms of its really broad landscape. And, you know, super educated for me, you know, I'm a social scientist by training. I have no formal training in um, racial and ethnic studies. And uh, so a lot of this process, you know, even getting to know you, you and uh, Ariana over the past couple of years, but this especially has really just sort of broadened my understanding of, um, you know, what people studying uh, Latinx issues in different fields are, are uh, doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things that that uh, just kind of jumping off that that it, that the opening conference did for me was help to really kind of like put before you know put before me and our audience here uh, in Iowa City uh, the the kind of like really authentic interdisciplinarity of Latina Latina Latinx studies. I mean, I remember when we were putting together the proposal. Uh, for the Mellon Foundation, one of the things that internally folks were kind of pushing us to was really like, you know, highlighting the the humanistic components of everything because that is something that that Mellon wants to see. And you know, our our kind of pushback along the way was, well, yes, you know, the humanities is really central to this, but you know, we really we have to have a, a truly kind of integrative. Uh, humanities and social scientific approach to this because that's what Latino Latino studies is, right? And so you, you know, we here, you know, here we have probably actually the 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 bulk of our uh, of our presenters, uh, their degrees were you know were in kind of social scientific yeah, right, fields, right? right, right, right two right. political scientists, right. two people anthropologists yeah. by training, um, uh, and so you know I think that that. Um, but I think even you know even amongst those folks, right, the way that they reach beyond the kind of like traditional confines of those disciplinary orientations to produce research, to produce scholarship, and to present that to audiences in a way that really spans disciplines um, and and really kind of exceeds those boundaries of disciplines, I think was really was was really good to see in person, right? Yeah. And the other thing, you know, came up a little bit in the roundtables that really strikes me is that, you know, we're talking about the same stuff, but we're talking about it with different methodological approaches and we're talking about it in different fields. But it's so on the one hand, I'm sitting in these presentations and, you know, we're just like, I've never thought about this stuff or, you know, this stuff's all new to me. And that on the other hand, it's all stuff I've, all, I, I've been thinking about for a long time. Right. And like both of those things are occurring simultaneously within that presentation. And so like when uh, Natalia was presenting and, you know, so, I'm, you know, I mean, history is, um, dealing with, again, a, a lot of similar issues. And she's talking about not just some of the difficulties about doing a uh, history about Latinx populations, but even sort of the concepts that are getting thrown out there, ideas like racial scripts, idea about sort of race um, re- re- relationality. These are not 
my words, right? Um, they're not the words of my discipline, but they're the same ideas that exist within my discipline. We just use different vocabulary. And so being able to have that other terminology mm-hmm. and understand how other people have used those ideas within their fields is super enriching in terms of like, well, have I been thinking about these ideas in you know, the best ways? And are there ways that I can modify, expand these ideas within my field based on what people in these other fields have been doing? And so, again, highly educative towards me in terms of making me a better racial and ethnic uh, studies sort of scholar, but I think also going to make me a lot, a much better political scientist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, a little more, a little bit more about that. Like, so like how specifically do you think that makes you a better, a stronger political scientist? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you just have, again, some of these concepts like, uh, um, you know, again, like Natalia's example I was just using uh, and particularly those ideas, scripts and, and race uh, relationality. And that's something that, I mean, those are ideas that that we have. Again, we don't have that language and they don't have as much the um, centrality in my field as I think they do in, in, in history. Mm-hmm. And so um, the idea of emphasizing them, of going into, you know, part of it is I have to continue this process, right? I have to go in, I have to now, having been exposed to this work, look into it a little bit more, see how it works, not just in, in a presentation, but at, in, you know, executed research. Um, but realizing, but, you know, as I do that and and as I think about sort of like, like, again, some of their stuff about, about her stuff about, you know, uh, um, scripts, what I saw there was stuff about how the way in which, you know, I'm going to pivot towards governmental institutions, uh, the, the way in which they talk about different racial and ethnic groups has significant ramifications for the way in which the, the groups see themselves, you know, and the way that they sort of like internalize um, some of those projections that are that are being put on them by by governmental institutions, right? Like that's an idea that you think political scientists might have like researched a lot and uh, paid a lot of attention to, but it's it's not, and it's something that like barely were you know within the past couple of years people have begun to have some kind of awareness of. And so, hey, if historians have been talking about this for a much longer period of time, that's something that you know political scientists would be really um, you know it, it would be smart for us to. to get into that and, and learn from it. Oh, Renee, I'm going to put something in the show notes that I think, that I think you'll like. I think it's something I tried to get you to read uh, a little while ago. I know you're a rhetoric guy. But, so like, well, you know. but, but there's, but there's, <laughs> but there, there's actually, there's this, uh, there's, there's an Iowa tradition here, right? There's, uh, there was, you know, something that kind of transpired, um, you know, that really kind of rose in the, I want to say it was the 1980s. I have to go check my notes, but the project on the rhetoric of inquiry here at the university, yeah. uh, which was, you know, which was in a lot of ways a partnership between faculty in uh, the you know communication studies, uh, doing rhetorical studies, uh, political science, mm-hmm. uh, and economics, mm-hmm. uh, and so you know to 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 do scholarship that addresses the ways in which those you know for example the kinds of terminologies that we use might shape how we evaluate and, uh, and, and shape the kind of knowledge production process within a discipline like political science um, has a, pr- it's a, it's a yeah, proud yeah, Iowa yeah, tradition. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So I'll put, a, there, there's, a, there's one essay in, in particular that I'm thinking of that's co-authored by an Iowa political scientist um, that I'll put in the show notes um, because yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's re- reignite the partnership between, uh, between rhetorical studies and, and political science here. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it, one of the things that I really appreciated about um, about the talks, uh, thinking in terms of interdisciplinarity here, is the way in which um, the scholars really took to heart how a, uh, a, a Latina, Latino, Latinx studies approach uh, generates ideas not only across disciplinary fields, uh, but also in a way that isn't bound by kind of ethnic enclaves, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, I thought um, I thought Gina Perez's work was mm, really absolutely. interesting in that yeah, regard, yeah. in particular, right? Yeah. The way that uh, that her research into sanctuary um, and her and her prior research too, right, kind of forced her to uh, to go beyond a kind of like Puerto Rican studies lens, for example. Mm-hmm. 
um, and to think about, to think in a, in a kind of broader Latino, Latino, Latinx studies lens. Yeah. I mean, you know, just from my own like personal research, like, what do I do? I, I am really interested in immigration enforcement in the United States. So a presentation on um, sanctuary cities was obviously very interesting for me substantively. Within that, you know, like I'm really interested in ideas of enforcement, not just along the border, but also within the interior. So seeing what it's looking like. In Ohio and some of these non-traditional destinations was, you know, uh, really fascinating. And again, this is where we get into the strength of the interdisciplinary approach. So what am I going to do? I'm going to like, oh, let me, you know, get this uh, survey of, of migrant behavior and let me get some data enforcement. Let me tie it together. Look, there's a relationship between these two uh, ideas. Um, you know, the, obviously I see a lot of value in that approach. Um, but absent the sort of um, it, it confirmation and enriching detail that an ethnography can provide, mm-hmm. you know, it's um, you know it's pretty dry and it and doesn't you know and, and it's it is I mean it's incomplete for all the value I associate with it. It's incomplete, and so um, having that sort of ethnographic information that Gina provided was just um, I, th- I think extremely helpful. Again, also super helpful to me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of like the, seeing these presentations at this particular moment in time is really helpful for me for a, a smaller kind of research project I'm working on. We were talking about before we started uh, before we started recording here. Um, I'm presenting a, 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 on a panel over at Iowa State University uh, in, in my world tomorrow. In the world of this airing, a few days before. Um, and it's a panel that's about kind of Latino Latino studies programs um, at various, some various Midwestern universities. And so I'm presenting about the kind of history and present and future of Latino, Latino studies at Iowa. Um, and in approaching it, you know, my inclination is always to go archival and to think, you know, in the kind of like critical rhetorical history kind of vein. Um, but I realized, you know, in preparing for it that like, I couldn't, there are questions that I cannot answer using just those forms of data. Um, and so um, I've been like going, combing through some census data and uh, internal University of Iowa data about the student population here. And I think the, that having this kind of you know, interdisciplinary perspective helps me learn some important lessons. Like one is that there are some things that quantitative data, right, is like really is really the best form of data to to help you evaluate. Like if you want to think about uh, notions of underrepresentation, for example, right, then you ha- then I, you know I have to be able to, to to crunch some of those data and think about what percentage of the uh, of the population, not just what percentage of the population in Iowa is Latino, Latino, Latinx, but breaking it down into the age group um, and how that maps onto the undergraduate student population at my university or other universities. Um, but also like where the humanities comes back into it too is recognizing that, you know, at particular history, we can use kind of generic uh, pan-ethnic labels like Latino or Latina, Latina, Latinx. Um, but at particular historical moments, uh, first, those terms sometimes don't make any sense, right? Mm-hmm. And second, uh, more specific terminology just like is really crucial to the kind of activism that emerged at that mm-hmm. moment in time. Mm-hmm. So like thinking about the history of Latinos and Latinos at the University of Iowa, you know, it's a history that really comes from the Chicano and Chicana experience mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. Iowa, mm-hmm. right? And so it's in the late 60s and early 70s that the like – literally handful of Chicano, Chicana students here band together uh, to form a student group uh, and eventually form what, what today is known as the Latino Native American Cultural Center. Um, at the time when it found, when it was founded was the Chicano, Chicano American Indian Cultural Center, I think. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I didn't, I mean, I don't know any of this history. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a really cool history. So there's a, um, there's a, a, a pretty well-known, I who was an undergraduate student here uh, in 1970, um, helped form the LNAC. When they founded it, right, it, it, one of the kind of like key things in founding it, um, she mentioned in a speech she gave here a couple years ago, was that there needed to be that acknowledgement that it was Chicano students who who did this. Um, and that's, you know, that was the student population at the time. I've been, mm-hmm. you, know, you go through the old 
student newspapers, and it's it's all about Chicano students, Chicano power, um, you know, connecting up with the the the, the kind of lettuce boycotts mm-hmm. and developing this political consciousness. And you know, we went from uh, you know really just like yeah, at that time, call it nineteen seventy. Uh, 1969, 1970, less than two dozen Chicano students uh, on campus, no professors. Yeah. Um, and by, you know, by like, you know, by basically each year, that number was like more or less doubling for, for a period of time. Of course, the university didn't actually keep numbers on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the yeah. university didn't, didn't start keeping official numbers on any of this, on, on race and ethnicity for any of the students until 1978. That was yeah. the first year they included it in their kind of annual profile of the student population. Which, you know, we're linking back to the idea of how institutions talk about individuals and how that re- results in the sort of internalization of uh, sort of identity and attitudes they have. We don't have to think about the federal government. We can just think about the university. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that's really interesting. I'm interested in, you know, next time we talk to Errol Holly, we'll hear how this panel went. And, uh, uh, and, you know, it's always interesting to think about ourselves relative to our Big Ten peers yeah. and, and our history and our development. I think, you know, one of the uh, sort of geekier but most fun moments at the conference uh, for me, I was having um, a dinner with, um, and I was sitting in between Anna and Gina, and we were just talking about like the history of the development of ethnic studies programs at our respective universities and the arc of going from uh, like program to department. And then, you know, Anna is the chair of an ethnic studies department, which means that she's the chair of a whole bunch of people that do Latinx studies and African-American studies. Right. And, you know, that's not the case in Oberlin, right, where Gina is. And so, um, you know, what are how all those things developed, um, you know, and let us, you know, and resulted in these different configurations. And what are, what, are, what are the pluses and minuses of those configurations? And important for us to think about, obviously, as we begin to develop our program and think about our path, you know? So, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's in, yeah. So, yeah that, that let, rem, that rem, let me know what they say over there. Yeah. About how they developed. And, and, you know, yes. I don't know if we've talked about this on the air. You and I have differing opinions on, on this. Um, on the development of like a Latino studies program, Latino Latino studies program versus like a broader ethnic studies program, and it's it, you know uh, uh, Pedro Caban in a in a piece in Latino studies, I think it's in the first, I think it might be even be the first issue of the journal Latino Studies, um, uh, which I also just remembered. There's a great open letter by um, uh, by Obler in there, like an open letter to university presidents about why. Latino Latino studies is like a good field for them to have at their universities. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, Caban's piece is nice because it historicizes the the kind of emergence and transformations of the fields and the kind of different forms that they've taken, including kind of as ethnic studies departments. And, um, and talking to my students about that, it's like, well, you know, the, some of that is part of a kind of like historical trajectory at places, right? And so, you know, you see at some schools, uh, especially on the coast where they start as like, you know, on the West Coast, they typically started as like Chicano studies, right? Yeah, right. East Coast, you know, Northeast especially, New York in particular, mm-hmm. more likely starting as Puerto Rican studies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and then kind of the transformations over the years, sometimes turning into Latino Latino studies departments and programs, sometimes turning into ethnic studies departments and programs. Yeah. But then like what happens kind of in the middle of the country ends up being a little bit different. It doesn't follow as clear of a pattern, right? So like Colorado, I believe, starts as like ethnic studies. Yeah. Um, Illinois starts – not that long ago, yeah, right, right, I, right, I, I right, always forget right. as Latino Latino studies, um, and then you know, and then whatever we're doing here at Iowa, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make you laugh. Like a v- very long time ago, I won't name the institution, but I almost uh, had a joint appointment in the Puerto Rican studies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember if they were a department or a center or like w- what they were, but like you know, <laughs> that's pretty. In, yeah, that's pretty really, amazing. yeah. Because they were trained to expand. They were trained to not just be Puerto Rican studies anymore. They were trained to you know, oh, make it into you know, so Latino like, studies, right? And if they're going to go after the Puerto Rican political scientists, I mean, you know, uh, they were, it was like, I don't, I don't know who they were going to get. So 
uh, yeah, that was a long time ago though. <laughs> but that's amusing. Um, but it was a, it was a institution on the East Coast, which is why you know it's it's relevant to what you just said. Um, I want to hear more about this after. Yeah, we can after turn we're done. Lines, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, right, very idiosyncratic, and so you know. Next episode, before we get into the meet, you can tell us um, sort of what you've inferred from from this Iowa State uh, venture. Oh yeah, yeah. I look forward to. I look forward to. That. I think it's going to be great. It's. I forget who. Uh, I forget all of the. Let's see it, it. So it's being hosted at Iowa State, which, by the way, has had Latina Latino studies in some form mm-hmm. for this is the twenty fifth anniversary. Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is bl- amazing. Which, which blows my mind. Yeah, I mean. It, it, yeah, it really blows my mind, uh, especially considering like where Iowa State's located. You know, they're, the county they're located in is uh, is one of the lower Latino Latino populations in the state. A neighboring county is one of the higher ones. Um, but like, you know, over here at the University of Iowa on this side of the state, we're you know Johnson County that we're located in is one of the kind of fastest growing Latino populations in the state. Uh, and two of our neighboring counties are two of the largest uh, Latino Latino populations in the state. And a neighboring town is the first majority mm-hmm. Latino town mm-hmm. in the state. Um, yet we're kind of 20 years behind yeah. Iowa State in developing uh, in developing this kind of programming. In addition to Iowa State being represented on, on this and the University of Iowa, I believe uh, f- there's going to be someone from the University of Michigan – uh, DePaul University and Indiana University, so a nice kind of, you know, mm-hmm. a nice cross section, and different of different histories of development um, and different institutionalizations too. So yeah, I'll, I'll, yes, I will talk about it on the next uh, on the next podcast. Um, and I think they're I think they're going to be videoing stuff too. So once videos come out, we'll be sure to like you know publicize those and uh, and add them to show notes at some point. So the the thing that uh, that I wanted us to talk about today in this kind of like transition episode, um, while we're recovering from the conference and not quite getting to talking about the next conference, um, which will be on uh, on migration, uh, is you know, is the topic of Latinidad. Um, so there's you know it's it's a it's a key term in our in our title. We've kind of like addressed it in uh, just kind of offhand in probably most of our podcast episodes, but haven't really done too much of a deep dive into the term and kind of why we're why we kind of remain committed to a, a version of this term, um, despite the kind of you know what I think is kind of a, a a popular resistance to it in some circles at least, right? Like since we've been recording. Uh, this podcast, there's at least kind of two big articles that have come out in um, in different news sources. So one in Romezcla uh, and one in uh, The Nation, most recently this one in The Nation called The Problem with Latinidad. Um, and so, you know, I wanted us to take like, a, you know, a few minutes here to, to talk about the kind of like arguments being presented um, and you know what the kind of scholarship says uh, says about this, and you know why we continue why why we decided to name you know our programming imagining Latinidades. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the general thesis of of uh, of these essays um, dealing with the problem with Latinidad is not is not really a new one. For at least the last decade, um, I think probably longer, uh, scholars have I think questioned the usefulness of Latinidad as a concept. So I'm thinking in particular, you know, two people I'm thinking of in particular are um, Francis Aparicio, uh, who's kind of, I think, most well known as a, as a scholar examining Latinidad and Latinidades, um, uh, and also a uh, political scientist, Beltran, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, who's, uh, who's, Work the trouble with unity. Um, I think s- starts off with a kind of examination of the what I frame when I teach it as the advantages and disadvantages of the of a kind of concept of Latinidad. Um, and with with both of these folks, I think they recognize that there's problems with this with with well first of all first of all there's problems with any kind of pan ethnic label mm-hmm. right any pan ethnic label risks 
homogenization, risks kind of flattening uh, the groups that are contained within it, right? I mean, that's why, you know, a label like Chicano or Boricua, right, is more specific and more kind of universalizable within uh, its population uh, because, you know, there's just, there's less kind of flattening perhaps that happens with that term. Although I think, I think even, even with that, there's a, there's flattening that occurs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the, you know, the, the, that prob the problem with Ladini Dad is that it, it risks a kind of like massive homogenizing effect um, that I think, tends to privilege uh, those who exercise greater political power underneath its umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are uh, certain class privileges that get kind of uh, get invisibilized. There are racial privileges and gender privileges that get invisibilized uh, by the use of that term. Um, and so, you know, scholars who've been writing about this, right, are like, pretty upfront about that. Um, I think that they, you know, that there's a lot of, and there's other good work at Angie Valdivia is another person who's written on this, uh, examining, you know, basically like cautioning people, Hey, if we're going to use this, you know, if, if this term is going to be useful, then it can't be used in this kind of like super flattening sort of way. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I want to actually want to probe you a little bit more about this, but you know, the one point I'll make here is the real centrality of this idea. I mean, in political science, uh, you know, the first uh, large data set on Latino issues, uh, oh, the first large uh, data set that had a nationally representative sample of Latinos was publicly released in 1996. And in 1996, in the, the Hispanic Journal of Behavioral Sciences, did a special issue of a bunch of um, articles. Uh, they were examining it. Again, this is like, so it's 1996. It's like the first time there's a bunch of like what you would call squarely Latino politics articles uh, that are that are coming out. And, you know, one of the articles uh, by uh, Michael Jones Correa and David Leal is looking right at this question of identity. And so it's there at the very beginning of basically the study of Latinos in my field. Um, and, you know, they're making... Uh, you know, some basic points about, you know, examining the extent to which it exists as a sort of cultural concept and then the, and the extent to which it exists as a sort of instrumental concept and the idea of instrument, instrumentality, I don't know, um, is I think picking up on some of the concepts that you're talking about right now about like how it's used and when it's used, it, it's, it's advantageous for particular groups, right? Uh, you know, I think it's hitting on, uh, on some of those ideas. But then, you know, we talk about, um, sort of like the extent to which it's uh, appropriate to use that concept or, uh, or or not, and sort of one of the points that we get really fixated here is the extent to which it exists within in in you know sort of my field is the extent to which it exists in people's minds, and it exists as a and there's a real like tendency to be like do people conceptualize themselves in this way right are they Latino Latino Latinx or are they a Chicano, right? Uh, and, um, you know, one of the important things to know is that they, they can be both, right? And they can be both, like, pretty interchangeably because people, you know, uh, people are large and they contain multitudes as, as women's kind of a weird reference for a, 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 a Latinx issues podcast, but okay. Uh, and, but, you know, they have these, um, you know, they can have these multiple identities, existing within their heads and then it's the extent to which what gets activated at particular points in time and uh studying like when you decide you know oh today i'm loving it uh, you know i'm just thinking you know i'm hanging out with my puerto rican friend and we're just a bunch of like right like i'm doing right now and we're, you know we're just a bunch of latinx scholars and and you know when i go home and and i decide that i'm chicano and i, I have no idea i can't even understand um any you know any of my puerto rican friends uh, um <laughs> You know, and so I think, you know, I think that that's, um, uh, you know, I, I think keeping that sort of lesson in mind, again, sort of the earlier lessons from my field. But like, tell me, you know, you talk about these criticisms, you've alluded to them. Can you like go a little bit more in depth with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that so the criticism seem to come from a couple of places. Like one is that, you know, one I think is that there is an assumption in some of the critiques that 
this is a term that is primarily an academic term. Perhaps the the, ter- the specific term Latinidad is largely a kind of academic term, but its root within you know, with with Latino right um, has a, a a much deeper history right. And I think you know that goes well beyond the kind of common narrative of. Uh, as a term that kind of emerges um, with popularity in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, you know, this is a term that goes back into the 19th century. So, I mean, I think that, you know, to, to reject it because of the, uh, because of its status as a kind of scholarly invention, um, I think risks dehistoricizing it a little bit. Yeah. But, so is, is the objection there that, the specific term, like the word, is a scholarly invention or the underlying concept, right? Because the concept is obvious, as I understand it, is clearly like not a scholarly, right? Yeah, I think it's the, I think, I think it's the, the term that the term. is, um, yeah, the term being used yeah. um, as kind of the like, the like anchor point, right, of a field and of scholarly discussions. And I mean, I think that you know, and the alternative to that, right, are the more specific kinds of identity labels that one might use, whether that is the kind of like still broad labels like Boricua or Chicano Chicano or whatever, um, or whether it's even, you know, I think more specific terms like Afro Boricua, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that criticism to me seems to prop up a kind of straw argument, right, that uh, that Latinidad is this kind of powerful label that is deployed in ways that are exclusive. And I think that when you look at the scholarly literature, at least, I don't think that that's the case. I mean, there's there's undoubtedly some people who do that, right? Yeah. Um, but most of the scholarship that I'm familiar with that we've been talking about here is, I think, cautious about using the term, right, and acknowledges the kind of pitfalls of it. Um, and I think that's more the norm uh, than the exception. Yeah. Yep. 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 I mean, you definitely can go down these rabbit holes of like how far you're going to go, right? You're going to go, you know, Puerto Rican, Afro Puerto Rican, like you're suggesting. But clearly, like something hangs this population together to some degree at some points in time, right? And so it's it's artificial to say that this population is held in complete unison yeah. with sort of gravitational, with this really strong gravitational force across all points in time, right? And so that's an art, of, you know, but like no one, no one asserts that, right? It, it's that understanding the there that's responsible for hanging it, hanging it together to some degree, to some point in time and, and you know, why that's the case. I think that's definitely, um, uh, you know, to, to not acknowledge that seems sort of as silly as as believing the opposite in the polar extreme, you know? Yeah. Well, and for, for me, it's a, it, like a term like Latinidad or my preference Latinidad is functions in a particular way. It has a particular, uh, sometimes a very kind of instrumental function, uh, sometimes a more kind of constitutive function, but in either case, it functions as what, what I'd call an agency, right? Agencies are things that, uh, that are means to a particular course of actions. They enable certain behaviors. Uh, they enable other discourses. Uh, they enable one or a group of people to position themselves in relation to others at a particular moment in time. They're never universal. They're always contingent and they're always contextual, right? And so like the, the, you know, the example you were using before to, to craft what, you know, are hanging out together uh, to do this podcast or for at the coffee shop or whatever uh, to 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 label us as Latinos doing that right or to tap into some notion of Latinidad at that particular moment, uh, there could be a host of reasons for doing that that enable certain actions and enable us to position ourselves in relation to others in some way that you know while that 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 we wouldn't do in a, at other mm-hmm. moments right and that we tap into different terminologies uh to do to enable different sorts of actions at other moments right and so you know to me it's i don't think it's i don't think it's a fair criticism uh anymore to say that la, that latinidades or latinidad um you know uh, posits a single narrative or is this kind of like purely academic and homogenizing kind of concept uh, because it 
that's not really how, to me, that's not really how it works in the day to day. It can, right? Which, you know, so I don't want to discount the fact that I think there are still ways in which Latinidad at different moments and in different communities and in different locations uh, can have that homogenizing effect and can write out uh, people who uh, who ought to be included under its banner. But that's also why I prefer the term Latinidades, the plural, to mm-hmm. Latinidad, mm-hmm. right? To kind of like build into the terminology that we're using a recognition that, there, the, the, yeah, there is no single Latinidad, right? There's never a single Latinidad. Even when we deploy uh, a seemingly stable notion of Latinidad at a particular moment, it's always contingent. It's always temporary. It's always contextual. Um, and, you know, it's going to shift, you know, perhaps 10 minutes later. Yeah, right. I mean, right, right, right. And that's what I'm saying. Like people are large, they contain multitudes. They really can have these identities um, the salience of that identity just vary over the course of time, you know, long stretches of time, short, short periods of time. And, um, you know, but the idea that it, the, it doesn't exist to some degree, again, uh, sort of an artificial, uh, just, you know, it, uh, um, it's just, it, you know, ex- just extreme in, in the other direction. And, you know, at certain points in time, the, the differences within, the community, um, you know, it's about going back to this idea of, of re- relationality, right? We know that it, it's dependent on on that sort of relational position. So, you know, heck, if I'm in a uh, growing up in the Rio Grande Valley and I'm in a ninety percent uh, Mexican American community, so like, like, screw ideas of like, like I, I, I didn't meet a single Puerto Rican in the first twenty years of my life, uh-huh. right? You know, I, everyone I knew was was you know of Mexican origin, and there's this big division on, between Mexican nationals, right, for, or uh, first generation immigrants and more assimilated sort of one point five second generation on Mexican Americans, right? And that's a big division, and there's a lot of difference in heterogeneity that's seen very clearly. You know, move me, talked a little bit about my biography at the beginning, move me to Central Texas. I never felt more tied to, you know, first generation Mexican immigrants than when I was in like Central Texas with a whole bunch of like Central, you know, not Mexican Central Texas yeah. people, right? And that has a real, you. so that sort of really sort of like all those differences got washed away, right? And then move me to the state of Iowa and, you know, you know, yeah, I'm friends with this Puerto Rican guy in, in communication studies, right? Like, you know, those differences get washed away. Right. And that's all, again, this idea of relationality, right? And that's in my, and, you know, so, you know, you don't have to, like, we can have these sort of like long academic debates, but I think if people just, you know, reflect on how they live their lives, they can see examples of this and the contextualization of it and how their identity sort of changes across time pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Iowa is just Iowa is a kind of prime example for this, right? Like, you you live in Iowa, and yeah, you know, you like I know I'm Boricua, right? Yeah. I've got I've got my Puerto Rican flag in my yeah, window. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, but when I'm out and about, right? I'm 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 Latino, right? I'm yeah. looking for other Latinos, and yeah. it kind of doesn't matter, right? What your particular family's country of origin is. You know, Latinas are going to stick together um, and build some solidarities around even those most tentative kinds of commonality. Mm Because, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, like, do I have that? How much in common do I have with, you know, with Rene, uh, the Mexican-American from the Rio Grande Valley? Yeah, right. Um, Not a ton, but, you know, but also how much how much do I have in common with uh, with, uh, you know, with the New Yorican? when I grew up in Western Washington State, of as one of like three Puerto Ricans in the yeah, town, right, 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 right. I mean, five if you count the rest of my family members. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. I mean, you know, yeah. Go to the you know Mexican restaurant in town, and it's not what they're serving in, in you know like Tex-Mex places in Rio Grande Valley, but you know, I'll cling to it. It's good, you know, yeah. Well, um, and, and and I will too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when I when I when I go into those spaces, right, I'm read as kind of belonging in the community because that's part of the kind of survival strategy that we develop in a place like Iowa, mm-hmm. right? Where we're not a kind of like the, a massive part of the of the population. Um, I think you find those commonalities and there's strength in finding those commonalities, right? Without having to, I think without having to, uh, to, to rest on a kind of flattening of difference. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's, and, and, and that's, and, and that's why, that's why I think ultimately having like Latina, Latina, Latinx studies 
courses and programs is also really valuable in university settings because we get to explore these issues, right? Yep. So I've never actually used the formal term uh, in my work. Uh, actually, most of the work I read doesn't use it. So I'll do an experiment. Next paper, I'm going to substitute it in. I'll let you. I'll, 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 I'll let you know what. I'll, I'll just talk about Latina Latina Dadas. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I'll just I'll just throw it in there, and I'll let you know what, what reviewer two says. <laughs> reviewer two, I can tell you right now, is not <laughs> going not to gonna be gonna happy work. with this. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to be happy. They're going to want you to say Hispanic. Yeah. Renee. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> uh, all right. We got to talk about the things that are coming up next. So. Um, I'm going to do a, a, a couple of previews here. So the first is uh, if you are in the Iowa City area, the Iowa City Metroplex, if you will, uh, we will have the first film in our film series, uh, which is going to be a total of four films over the course of the year. Uh, this first one is the uh, the classic film, La Bamba. Um, which will be which screen- Renee has never seen. Which Renee has never seen. Please, 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 <laughs> please tweet. Please at Renee uh, about how horrible a person he is. We've uh, a person now, he now is for fairness, having never seen the film. That's just like my. That's nothing particular to the film. That's just my general like lack of film awareness and knowledge. So generally, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay still at him about this because <laughs> we've been we've been like passing back and forth lots of gifts uh, and stuff uh from the film just to uh, to you know to poke fun at him a little bit um but that film is going to screen uh, at film scene on the ped mall in iowa city um on october 10th at 5 30 p.m uh, it'll be followed by a panel discussion uh the participants in which uh, have yet to be named uh, then the next event will be uh, will be our next uh, speaking event. So we'll have you know from from here on out until the end of the year, we're going to have one day symposia. Our next symposium is on Friday, October twenty fifth, uh, and it's titled Latina Latina Latinx Migration. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about it in the next episode of the podcast where we'll actually kind of like dive into uh, our speakers and their prior research uh, and talk about the themes leading up to the symposium. So I don't want to spoil too much now. Uh, but if you go to our website, imaginingletinidades.com, you will find uh, the list of the speakers. And we haven't updated the website yet, although very soon we will be to include the titles of their talks uh, and abstracts for their talks. So uh, look for that in the next week or so, uh, certainly before the next episode of the podcast. Additionally, uh, just a way to kind of close out, we would love to hear your thoughts on Twitter. So we are at Imagining Lat uh, for the podcast. Uh, we also uh, are happy to receive emails from you, podcast at imaginingletinidades.com. Uh, and as always, please share this podcast with friends and be sure that you subscribe. And if you are willing and able, please give us five stars uh, at Apple Podcasts uh, and uh, write a review for us if you are feeling up to it. Those reviews and those ratings really help to increase the visibility of the podcast and to expose us to more people and give us a fighting chance of uh, making it onto the different kinds of like curated lists that Apple does and that others do as well. Um, and with that, thank you for listening. Uh, please check the show notes for uh, links to the articles and stuff that we were talking about uh, and the people we were talking about. And uh, yeah, in two weeks, we'll be back. Hopefully, all three of us will be here in two weeks. We, have, we haven't talked about that for sure yet, Renee. Hey, you said I couldn't swear. <laughs> <laughs> with that, have a great day. Thanks for listening in. Thanks for listening in.